Every time, yeah, that's, go ahead and clap. I, every time I've heard that, I've got chill bumps when everybody says it together uh, about who Jesus is. But anyway, well, let's get started. Let me ask you a question. Why would doctors with organizations like Samaritan's Purse travel to different parts of the world that don't like Americans very much to treat these horrible diseases that are contagious, even though they're subjecting themselves to that same disease as well? Well, why would missionaries like Jay and Caitlin Greer, our mission partners in Japan, why would they leave all of their friends and their family, travel halfway around the world to plant churches for people that they don't even know? Why would Christians in other parts of the world where it's dangerous to be a Christian risk jail or even being killed for their faith? Well, this week we're kicking off a brand new sermon series called Centered where we are going to preach chapter by chapter through the book of Philippians. And the book of Philippians is actually a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a church in Philippi, and he wrote it somewhere around 60 to 62 AD, so about 30 years after Jesus rose from the dead. This is a church he knew very well because he had actually started that church about 12 years before that when he was traveling there on his second missionary journey in 49 AD with another missionary named Silas, and they were there together. So he knew this church, and he's writing this letter to encourage this church. And so we learn about this a little bit in the book of Acts. We see those things. You can, If you go to Acts chapter 16, you can read about the, the planning of this church. One of the things you read is that the very first church member was probably a very wealthy woman named Lydia. She was in the fashion industry. She was a dealer in purple cloth. Now, purple cloth may not mean anything to you today, but 2,000 years ago, that was a big deal because purple dye was very hard to make. It was very rare. And so only the most wealthy and rich people could actually wear clothes made of purple dye. So what we know about Lydia is that she was probably part of the in crowd. She probably knew all of the rich and the powerful in the city. Now, she was one of the very first church members, but we also learned about another early church member. She was a slave girl who was possessed by a demon. Now, this demon gave her the ability to tell people's fortunes, and so her owners were making a lot of money off of her by having her tell people's fortune in exchange for pay. That was the second one. And so how she became a church member is Paul actually cast out the demon that was in her, but the problem for her was in that moment is she could no longer tell the future. And so her owners got very upset at her. They got upset at Paul and Silas. So they have Paul and Silas severely beaten and they have them thrown in prison at that point. Now, we probably wouldn't blame Paul and Silas, I mean, for feeling a little bad for themselves about being stuck in prison when they want to be out preaching the gospel and starting churches. In fact, you know, we might expect that Paul would just sit in his jail cell and, you know, post pictures of his injuries from being beaten in the little bitty cell they were in and put that on Facebook and Instagram. Maybe he'd call the The Facebook, you know, that album, he'd call that Suffering for Jesus. And I bet if he did that, we'd give, you know, lots of little, the little praying hands emojis and little crying face things. But that's not what they do. They're in prison and they start to sing and praise God. And when they do that, God shows up. God sends this supernatural earthquake that throws open all the jail cell doors. It, all their chains and and different things fall off. And the Roman jailer sleeps through the whole thing. And so he wakes up, all, all everybody is, uh, he thinks everybody is gone because all the doors are open, and he's about to kill himself. And he does that because if a, if a Roman guard allowed his prisoners to escape, he would be punished with everything they were supposed to have been punished with. So rather than going through a trial and all of that, he's just going to end it right there and kill himself. But Paul yells out, hey, nobody's left, we're all here. You know, imagine how blown away he was by that. And so Paul gets the opportunity to share the gospel with this Roman jailer, and he becomes the third. So let me walk you through the role of this new church. You've got a fashion Easter who's very wealthy and powerful. You've got a slave girl who was possessed by a demon, and you've got a rough and tumble Roman jailer. So if you think your community group is made up of some different people, you can't stick. The central theme of Philippians is a challenge by the Apostle Paul to be centered on the gospel. 
And, and so what he is saying is that we ought to focus on who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And then that gospel, that truth of the gospel, should then drive everything we do. It should affect how we live, how we think, how we talk, how we deal with one another. All of that is driven by the gospel. And I want you to notice as we go through this passage of Scripture today, how many times that Paul uses this word gospel. He's going to do it a bunch. All right, let's dive in. Look at Philippians 1, 1 through 2. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So now this last verse, grace and peace, is a pretty typical greeting for Paul because he would be writing to both Jewish and Gentile Christians. And the word peace or shalom in Hebrew was a very typical Jewish greeting for one another. But the word grace, or in Greek, charis, where our church name comes from, the word charis or peace was a very typical greeting for his non-Jewish Christians. And so he greets them both with grace and truth. And that was a grace and peace. And that was a pretty typical thing. But he also uses some language of identity in this introduction. He says, to all God's holy people. That might have felt a little odd to some of these church members to be called God's holy people. We just talked about three of the people that were in this church. There was a, the fashionista who's very wealthy and powerful. We have a former slave girl who was formerly possessed by a demon, and we've got a Roman jailer. This isn't exactly who you want to plant a church with. Like if Paul were writing up a church plant plan to get funding from other churches, these people would not be on his plant team. You want people who are the very best and, and most uh, sincere Christians to, that come from one church to start another. Lydia was probably the most fit for this church plant team. I mean, she at least was, you know, living in normal society. She, but she was probably very busy. And she probably had a very busy social calendar and business calendar. She was probably caught up in material things of the world. Roman jailers were not church plant material typically because Roman jailers were Roman legionnaires usually who got too old to serve in the legion. And so they would be put into a jailer capacity. So this was a Roman soldier who had probably experienced lots of death and injury and pain over his career. And we know he was a pretty tough dude because when he was told to put Paul and Silas in jail, he did more than that. He also put them in stocks. And if you don't know what stocks are, it's really a torture device. It holds you very much in place so they couldn't have got up and walked around the jail cell. They couldn't even really reposition how they were sitting. And so we know he had no problem with causing other people pain. The last member of the church that we know about was a former slave girl who'd been possessed by a demon. That's normally not who you want running your children's ministry in your new church, right? Just imagine what small group Bible study look like. It would be this breakfast club of people with different struggles. And this jailer, he was a work in progress. He, he was learning to be meek and gentle and loving and kind. Think about all the hang-ups this former slave girl probably had. She probably struggled with her identity. She struggled with feeling worthy and loved by the people around her. And, and even Lydia, this very wealthy woman, would have probably struggled with pride and trying to make Jesus the center of of her life as opposed to all of the wealth and different things that she had. They were all flawed individuals. But when they chose to follow Jesus, they became God's holy people. So often I think we're, we feel like we're kind of unique in our struggle, that we've got some baggage that nobody else has or we've got some struggles that no one else has. And we see that's not the case here. These are people that are just like you. They've got more baggage than you can think about. If you hadn't been possessed by a demon, you can't stick. And yet, when we follow Jesus, we become God's holy people. That, that's the power of the gospel. That's the transformation that immediately happens. Not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done for us. That's the power of the gospel. All right, look at verses 3 through 6. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from this day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You can see in this passage of scripture how much Paul loves this group of people. They've been partners with him in ministry and supported his ministry. 
But I love the challenge to them. He says, you are all God's holy people. You were immediately transformed when you followed Jesus. You became justified or made right with God instantly. And yet, he's challenged them to work with God to fulfill God's plan for them to see it to completeness. There's this big church word called sanctification. And it really what it means is the process of becoming more and more like Jesus throughout the course after you become a Christian, and it only ends when you leave this earth. And that's what he's talking about. He is saying, allow God to continue this process in you. And I think so often we think about Bible characters as being supernatural or superhuman. Like once they decided to follow Jesus, they never had another bad thought. They never committed another sin. But it's clear by the way Paul is challenging them that this isn't true. He's encouraging them to continue in the struggle, to be transformed to look more and more like Jesus. And and so what he's saying is that they're the same as us. They're just normal people. There are days they probably got up and didn't want to go to church that day. There were days they didn't want to rush home from work and scramble around to try to get ready for community group. And He wants to do the same thing. They are just normal people. He wants to transform us and sanctify us over time. The work of sanctification is a joint process between you and God. God provides the power, but you've got to let him do it. And it continues all the way until your life on this earth is over. All right, look at verses 7 through 11. He says, it is right for me to feel this way about all of you. He's talking about how much he loves them. Since I have you in my heart. And whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God." So he's encouraging them and saying, I love how you love, but I want your love to be more focused on the gospel. I want it to be focused on the truth of the Bible. There's a difference between loving people and loving people like Jesus loves people. See, the way Jesus loves people is a sacrificial love. It is built on grace and truth. It's all about serving and putting other people ahead of yourself. The other kind of love is kind of unfocused. It's a little selfish. It doesn't really have direction. My golden retriever, Milo, he is the perfect example of this unfocused kind of love. There is no doubt. He loves everybody. If you come to my house, he will love you, no question. If there are a lot of people at my house, he runs from person to person, making sure he gets to love and be loved by everybody there. When I come in, I can walk into the room having just petted him, and I sit down in my chair, and every time... He comes and gets up on me. Now, he's too big to get up in the recliner with me. So what he does is he puts his paws up on my chest with his back legs on the ground. And he will stay there for an hour, hour and a half, just forcing me to to love on him and loving me. And he will nuzzle with me. He loves me. It's got to be uncomfortable for him. I know it's uncomfortable for me. When I'm sitting at the kitchen table trying to work on my computer, he'll come up and he will literally take his nose and put it under my hand and throw it up in the air, reminding me that he's more important than whatever I'm working on. Now, he's also done that a few times when I have a hot cup of coffee. And so the coffee will go everywhere. Milo's not worried about whether I get burned. He's not worried about whether I'm working on a sermon and I'm behind. I I think I could have a heart attack and fall out on the floor. That little dude would come up and start throwing my hand up in the air. He, he's not dialing 911. Milo has a lot of love, but Milo's love is on his terms. It, it's not focused. And, and Paul is ch- calling us to a deeper love. He's challenging this church in Philippi, and he's challenging us to have a love that's laser focused on the truth of the gospel, to have a love like Jesus, filled with grace and truth. The word Paul uses here for love is the Greek word agape. And agape love is a perfect love of God. It's the love that Jesus has for us. We can't love without Jesus without learning what the Bible has to say about how Jesus loved. That's the problem. That's how you're not focused is because you really don't understand what it looks like to love other people like Jesus and with the truth of the gospel. Now, our love becomes focused 
as we learn more and more about who Jesus is and his truth in the Bible. We do that by coming to church on Sunday mornings. We do that by being in small group Bible study. We do that by learning to study the Bible on our own. You know, I read that church attenders attend church 1.4 times per month. You cannot learn to love like Jesus when you just show up for church every once in a while. For parents, you need to make sure your kids are, lear- needing to, are learning to love the way Jesus loved. To have a love that is focused on purity and holiness and the truth of God. I hear so often from parents, they'll say, yeah, we don't really want our, our junior high or high school student to go to big church because we don't want them to, to hear the tough sermons and we don't want them to hear the adult topics. I think that's such a mistake. Your kid can understand. I was reminded of this last week after I'd preached a very tough sermon. It was on the the prophecy in Daniel, and we were talking about heaven and hell. When it was over, this family comes up, and they've got a nine-year-old son, and they told me he loved your sermon. He was asking questions all the way through. And then that nine-year-old started telling me about the things that he loved about the sermon. Dude's nine years old, and he is growing in the truth of God. We don't give our kids enough credit for their knowledge. See, we, we think we're protecting them and sheltering them from the tough truth in the Bible. But the reality is they're not being sheltered out in the world at school and with their friends. They need that tough truth from the Bible so that they know how to respond to tough things in the world. One of the main reasons we don't have student programming on Sunday morning here at Karis City is because we believe that junior high and high school kids need to be in church. They need to worship as a family with you. They need to be a part of what we're doing. They need to hear that tough truth so that they're prepared to deal with a very tough world around them. They can understand. And it's so important for them to experience an adult faith in Jesus before they leave home and live on their own. So I want to challenge us to love one another with this laser-focused love, this love of Jesus. And we got to serve and take care of one another. When somebody is sick or going through something difficult, we got to rally around. And I love that our church does a great job of that. But I'm going to be honest, some of you guys kind of sit back and wait to see if everybody else will take care of it. You cannot have a love like Jesus when you are not taking care of other members of this church family. Love that doesn't motivate us into action isn't agape love. It's Milo love. We also need to encourage and challenge each other. Listen to how the Bible says this in Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The writer of Hebrews is challenging the church back then and saying, hey, you guys got to go to church. You got to continue to meet together. Some of you aren't doing that. He's also challenging us to the same thing. See, I think so often we decide whether we're going to go to church on Sunday mornings or Bible study or some mission event or some other church function, and we're looking purely at how it benefits us. What am I going to get out of it? What's what's the good? That's my low love. That's not Jesus' love. And I think as churches and preachers, we really do you guys a disservice because we tend to promote things pretty much on what you're going to get out of it. And what we're doing is we're encouraging you to think about the selfish things when we should be challenging you to the commitment of Christian community. The reality is for Christian community to work, somebody's got to be giving for someone else to receive the benefit of that. Christian community requires Christ-like love. See, and when we don't have confidence in your willingness to rise to the challenge, we're holding you back from growing in agape love. We, we need to talk a lot more about the obligations of Christian community than the benefits. And there are absolutely benefits of Christian community. There are also obligations and responsibilities. Think about it this way. You decide you're not going to go to church that Sunday morning because, you know, it's just kind of fun to stay in bed today. And a first-time guest comes in that maybe knows you from work or school or from social activity. They show up, and, and because you're not here They don't connect the way they should. That may keep them from experiencing Christian community. It may even keep them from following Jesus. There are obligations of Christian community. Loving each other like Jesus also means that sometimes 
We have to have hard conversations with one another and kind of confront one another about struggles and sin in our life. The reality is if Jesus were to sit down with you over a cup of coffee, he'd be pretty direct with you about your sin struggle. He might say, your pornography is no good. It's costing you intimacy in your marriage. He, he might say, man, you're drinking, it's getting out of hand, and it's costing you your family. He, he might say, you're, you're using sex with your boyfriend or girlfriend to try to feel loved, but all it's doing is causing you problems for later on. He, he might say, your anger and your bitterness, it's killing your relationship with your parents or your kids or your family. And we've got to have that same honest love for one another. We've got to be less worried about whether somebody's going to be irritated with us and more worried about their life. We value them so much that we're willing to put their well-being ahead of our own relationship with them. That's how Jesus loved. And so if we're going to have that laser-focused love on the gospel, we have to love one another that same way. Here's the, the biggest area where I think we exhibit this Milo kind of love is when it comes to the truth of eternity. There is this huge disconnect between what we know about heaven and hell and how we communicate that to the people we care about. Jesus could not be any more clear. The Bible could not be any more clear that there are physical places called heaven and hell and that every single person will spend all of eternity in one of those two places. And it's not decided based on whether we didn't kick dogs or kick old people. It's not decided by if we were a good person or not. It's decided solely by did we decide to believe in Jesus and make him Lord and Savior of our life. We know that. We love people. And yet we sit back and we let eternity get closer and closer without taking action. We have an unfocused kind of love. Here's the reality. As Christians, we're just like wonders, wanderers in the desert that have found this beautiful oasis filled with pure and perfect water. And it's not like it's a little oasis that's too small for other people. There's plenty of water for everybody. But yet we sit at this oasis with our life-giving water. And we just watch as people we care about continue to walk through the desert towards death. And so the question really becomes, do we believe what the Bible says? Do we believe Romans 6, 23 that says the wages or the price of our sin is eternal death, but only through Jesus can we have eternal life? Do we believe that? And if we do, why do we not live that out? Because if we have a deep understanding of the gospel, man, we're going to be on Facebook and Instagram sharing church messages. We're going to be sharing the truth of God. We're going to be inviting people to church. We're going to be sharing our faith because we care about those people. We try to make it easy on you to invite people to church. We've got invite cards. They're out in the lobby. They're at a table out there. They're also on the back of the sign as you go out the front door. But if we believe the truth of the Bible, don't we need to be motivated to invite people to church and to share our faith with them. It's almost absurd to think about truly believing the truth of heaven and hell and not sharing it with the people we love. Well, let's keep going. Look at verses 12 through 14. It says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Now, it may surprise you a little bit that Paul wrote this letter from prison in Rome, which really shouldn't surprise us because he was in and out of prison all the time for sharing the gospel and generally just being a pain to the Jewish uh, leaders. So he's in prison and he's writing this letter to encourage the people in Philippi, the church in Philippi, not to be discouraged that he's back in prison. And, and Paul is saying, look, hey, this is a good deal for me because I'm getting a chance to share the gospel in a different place. He didn't see it as an obstacle. He saw it as an opportunity. And, and so often I think that we see every negative turn in our life when something goes wrong, we see it as a prison cell. We, we just see it as something that we got to get out of. And, and we don't see it as an opportunity. We think that maybe God's forgotten about us or he's punishing us for something. 
Paul's not being punished. Paul is being given an opportunity to share the gospel in a different place. So often we never think about the reality that we may be in that situation to make a difference in someone else. And he's saying, look, not only am I getting to share the gospel with everybody in prison, but because of my faith, because I'm in prison for sharing the gospel, all the preachers and the church leaders and the Christians, they're becoming more bold in sharing the gospel with other people because they know if Paul can go to prison for their faith, so can they. See, you never know how God will use a circumstance that you're going through to help other people. But I think the problem is when we get in these situations, man, we just cry out to God to get us out of it. And we never once think about who we can help when we're there. See some of those as opportunities to share your faith, to share something with someone else that needs it. I can't tell you how many people my wife Lil has impacted through her lupus. Yeah, it's, it's no good. She hurts. She struggles. She's tired. But she uses that as an opportunity to help other people. That's how we need to see some of these things, not always as an obstacle to be released from, but an opportunity. Don't just see your struggle as a prison cell. See as it a platform to help other people and share your faith. All right, look at verses 15 through 18. He says, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. Now, at first glance, this part of the scripture is a little hard to understand. I mean, like, why would someone preach the gospel out of envy? Well, here's what I think is going on. Paul is the greatest missionary and very looked up to in the early church. He's now in prison, so he's not traveling around preaching. So I think some other guys thought, this is my opportunity to steal a little of his uh, love from the churches, to steal a little of his fame. And, And so they start preaching in a way to try to elevate themselves to fill in the gap that he's not there for. And so I think what I love about Paul is he's going, look, there, there are dudes that are preaching the gospel for all the right reasons. There are people preaching the gospel for all the wrong reasons. I don't care. I praise God for both of them. I'm praying for the people that are trying to take my success because the gospel is getting preached. You know, I think sometimes we get so caught up in how we think church ought to go <laughs> that we forget that all around the world the gospel of Jesus is being preached. It may not be preached, and church may not be done exactly the way we think it should be done, but we need to celebrate that. We need to pray for those churches, even if we don't agree with everything they're doing, because the gospel is being shared. Yeah, there are preachers out there who preach because they love the platform. They love the limelight. There are preachers who just like telling people what to do, but there are way more preachers that are just sharing the gospel because they feel called. And they thank God every day that they're in that place. And so what I love is Paul's attitude about this. He says, look, if I'm out there, I get to travel all around and preach to everybody. If I'm in chains, I'm preaching here in prison. And I'm praying for everybody sharing the gospel, no matter why they do it. All right, look at verses 19 through 26. He says, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of his spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but I will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. What do you do with this dude, Paul? You can't scare him with death because he's ready. You you say, well, we're going to kill you if you don't stop preaching. He's like, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to see Jesus right now. Paul did not see dying for Christ as being a sacrifice. He actually saw living for Christ to be a sacrifice. He was ready to go. So you can't threaten him with death. 
So you throw him in prison to keep him from preaching the gospel, and he preaches to your staff, and all your prison staff becomes a Christian. You threaten to beat him, and he goes, ah, I get to suffer for the gospel. What would it be like to have that kind of faith? You couldn't shake Paul because his hope wasn't in this world. His hope was in heaven. He was ready to go. And because of that, he had a joy and a peace and, a, and faith that you just couldn't shake. Now, let's be honest. You're probably never going to be killed for your faith because we live in the U.S. I'm probably never going to be jailed for preaching the gospel. But what would it be like to have this kind of faith when life takes a turn on you? When you go in for a routine physical and suddenly realize you're in a fight for your life. Or you lose your job and the financial security you've always had is suddenly gone. Or you lose a loved one. It's that hope in heaven. It doesn't keep you from being sad. It doesn't keep you from being stressed. But it doesn't take away your hope. It doesn't take away your joy. Because you know that the best is yet to come. To have that kind of faith, you got to have a deep relationship with Jesus based on the truth of the Bible. And I'm going to be honest, man, I'm still a work in progress when it comes to having that kind of deep faith. I'm not there yet. I'm not where Paul was. But what it looks like to live out the gospel is that when we live out the gospel, we think less about ourselves and we think more about God. We serve ourselves less and we serve other people more. We are so focused on God and other people that our lives become less important and that prepares us to deal with the ups and downs in our own life. That's how we have that kind of faith. All right, and then look at how Paul wraps up. This is Philippians 1, 27 through 30. He says, whatever happens, now this is a challenge to the church, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or I only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to him that they, they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you're going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. His final challenge, his plea, is my plea to you. Live a life worthy of the gospel. There were some missionaries at the turn of the century, uh, the turn of the 20th century, that were called one-way missionaries. And they would ride out on a boat to the mission field and never to return. And, and instead of packing suitcases or trunks, they packed all of their lifelong belongings into the coffin that they one day would be buried in. And, and they did that as a sign of their resolve that when they left, got on that boat, they were never going back home. A.W. Milne was one of those one-way missionaries. And he took a boat to the South Pacific to some islands where there were headhunters that had killed every single missionary that had been there before. But Milne, he wasn't worried about his life. He'd already given his life to Jesus. And, and so he gets on that boat and he goes and he lives with those headhunters. And for 35 years, he stays there showing them the love of Jesus Christ. 35 years later when he died, they buried him in the middle of the village. And they wrote these words on his tombstone. When he came, there was no light. When he left, there was no darkness. Well, what an incredible legacy that he left. He lived a life worthy of the gospel. He changed the eternal destination, not just of the people he shared with, but generations of people in the South Pacific. Look, we're, we're not all called to be missionaries but we are all called. And so let me ask you, are, are you living a life that's worthy of the gospel? Are you living for Jesus? Or are you just mostly living for yourselves? I don't know what you're called to, but I do know that you're called. And the question is, how will you respond? Let's pray.